If you guys watched Saturday Night Collision last night, you would have seen the start of Adam Copeland's Cope Open for the AEW TNT Championship. A lot of people were having mixed feelings about another open challenge for another AEW Championship. Me specifically saying, why don't we create these titles and make them feel important and give them their own identities? Who was the first to answer Adam Copeland's open challenge? That was Matt Cardona completely flipping the script on what AEW was doing with the open challenge. But does this mean Matt Cardona is now all elite? I will give you guys the story on how that match came about, how I predicted it, and basically how I feel about Matt Cardona landing in AEW. Also on Collision last night, a major injury scare with Ricky Starks. Update on him, which basically WWE is going to end up getting Ricky Starks. That's the feeling I got coming out of last night's match. I felt like he just wrestled like he didn't give a shit. But last night he was injured in a match that he and Big Bill should have won on their way to the semifinals in the AEW Tag Team Title Tournament. We'll talk about that as well. Jade Cargill and how her entrance has been created to create this aura of Jade Cargill being the biggest female star in WWE. And a gimmick match in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal was scheduled to take place at WrestleMania. And now, no longer. I got my opinion on that right here on this very happy Easter Sunday episode of Off the Script. We'll start with Matt Cardona. Now, on Tuesday, Mr. Baydala and myself got into a little bit of a heated debate about the Cope Open. And he was completely in favor of the Cope Open give it a chance, it's going to be an open challenge that gives us more of Adam Copeland. More of Adam Copeland on Saturday night, a destination where you could watch Adam Copeland do his thing, giving you a reason to tune in to AEW Collision. That's all fine and good. But my argument to that was, how many times have we seen the open challenge in AEW, and how many times have they beaten a dead horse with the concept. The fans just know what to expect. I don't want another open challenge like we've seen with everybody before Adam Copeland, whether it was Ricky Starks, whether it was Cody Rhodes, whether it was Brody Lee, whether it was Wardlow, or whoever was holding that championship. We get the same thing with Orange Cassidy in the international championship. All it was was open challenges. I'm not really here, and I'm not interested in Adam Copeland defending the title against Tony Nese or Lee Moriarty, Butcher and Blade, Brian Keith. To me, those matches are not open challenges. That's just lazy creative. That's basically what that is. So what I said on Tuesday is, if you really want this Cope open, to mirror what John Cena did with the United States Championship, which today people still talk about as being one of the greatest open challenges or stretch of open challenges in the modern WWE history. That's what you need to model it off of. And if you really want it to be an open challenge, it needs to be somebody that's not in the company, somebody that people know, a major star, somebody that's going to really represent what the open challenge is really means, in walks Matt Cardona. I wasn't even watching AEW Collision while it was happening. I was actually catching up on The Walking Dead because it's episode five of six with Michonne and Rick. And I get a text from my guy, Big Hodge. He's like, holy shit, with a shocked emoji. I'm like, what happened now? And then he's like, Cardona's on Collision. I'm like, what? You gotta be fucking kidding me, man. I'm like, I called this. I said on Tuesday, if you're going to do anything in regards to an open challenge, it better be a fucking Matt Cardona or someone like Matt Cardona. And here we are. So obviously, I'm going to pat myself on the back and I'm going to tell you all that somebody, somebody is listening because this match, 
literally came about days after I had mentioned it with Andrew Baydala on Tuesday's TNT. Cardona appeared as a surprise opponent for Adam Copeland in the Cope Open on AEW Collision. And Fightful has the update. They are told that as of now, Cardona remains a free agent and has not signed with AEW. The deal to have Cardona make his appearance came together this week, says Fightful. He was originally scheduled to face Ultimo Dragon at the Squared Circle Expo, defending his championship on Saturday. However, the booking came, and instead the plan was altered to have Cardona drop the Squared Circle Expo Championship Friday night on Black Label Pro. Then Cardona traveled to Canada to make the AEW date last night. Cardona told Fightful recently that there hasn't been much of a relationship or interaction with AEW since his initial appearances years ago. That's amazing. So it literally came about probably, I would say, Thursday or Friday going on into Saturday so Matt Cardona could get on a plane and make it to Canada to be in the ring with Adam Colpin for the TNT Championship. So clearly they say he's not all elite. It was a one-time thing. First, I want to say this. Kudos to Tony Khan for actually giving us an open challenge worthy of an open challenge. Now AEW has very lofty goals to try and one-up what they did here with Matt Cardona. They can't give you Matt Cardona and then go and give us fucking Butcher or Blade or uh, somebody else that we don't really give a shit about that's currently employed on the AEW roster. We need top-tier guys... And I'm not saying we have to have an open challenge every single week because then you're going to blow through everybody and there's going to be nobody left, which we saw last night at the end of the match. Malachi Black showed up and confronted Adam Copeland. And then the rest of the House of Black came out and beat up Adam Copeland, which then led to Eddie Kingston and Mark Briscoe coming on out, saving the day. And that match is actually booked. Big six-man tag team match at Dynasty. So I don't have a problem with that at all. If it leads to a Adam Copeland Malachi Black one-on-one match, you got my thumbs up, a, a thumbs up of approval there. But the thing is, AEW's got some very lofty goals now. They gave you Matt Cardona. What's the next Cope Open gonna be? And it needs to be someone along the lines of a Matt Cardona. He needs to go out there, Tony Khan, and get uh, Mustafa Ali. He needs to go out there and get a Nick Nemeth. Those are the guys that it needs to bring on in. A Matt Riddle. People like that that are going to have some name value and bring them on into AEW television and do the Cope Open that way. Or, or anybody else that has a major presence on the independent scene. I'm not saying it has to be an ex-WWE guy. Somebody on the indies that has a major independent presence that people are going to know. Somebody that's not with the company. A genuine surprise. I don't want to see fucking Brian Keith out there wrestling for the TNT Championship when he just was in there a few weeks back wrestling Eddie Kingston for the Continental title when Eddie Kingston was the Continental Champion. We don't need to do that. The International Championship has open challenges. The TNT title has open challenges. The Continental title was having open challenges before they put it on Okada. These titles need to have some identity. If Adam Copeland wants to do the John Cena shtick, then by all means, do it. But it's got to be special. It's got to be right. It's got to be people that are genuine surprises, not fucking Tony Nese or some some dummy that's on Ring of Honor that nobody knows. That's not going to gener- generate interest. That's not going to get people like me stopping watching what they're doing and jumping on over to Collision because that's, act- that's exactly the type of reaction that I had. I'm like, oh shit, I got to stop what I'm doing. I got to watch this because who knows if he's ever going to be back and we're ever going to get this match again. So good on them. I enjoyed it. I thought it was great. I'm sure Drew and I will talk about this in the week to come because it was a hot topic of discussion on Tuesday, but I loved what they did, and I hope they keep up that foundation for the Cope Open if they're going to continue using it as a gimmick. Now, as far as Cardona, he's not all elite. I don't suspect him to be all elite. I do think, in my honest opinion, in my heart of hearts, I do think that he wanted to get this match out of the way because he's been saying for years that this is a dream match. He wanted it for a very long time. I do think Cardona, if he goes to AEW, his stock will drop 
I think right now it's at the highest it's ever been. It continues to rise because of the work he's doing on the independent scene. He's more of a star on his own, being a freelancer, than he would be in AEW. He'd just get lost in the shuffle. He's not going to be a main event guy. He'd just fit in like everybody else. And that star that he's developed for himself will ultimately fade in AEW. I don't think that's the right move for him unless he's just there wanting a payday, which we all know he's making great money now. Why take great money to be less of a star? Why don't you make great money and elevate your star and continue to do that on the independent scene? I do think in my heart of hearts that Matt Cardona is back in WWE, and I do think we see him back in WWE after WrestleMania. That's just my honest prediction there. That's my honest opinion on that. Take it as you must, but I think Matt Cardona is ending up back in WWE. I don't think he would take anything less. I think that was the whole, the whole goal. Leave, make himself into what he is now, go back where they can't deny you any longer. That's the way it's always been. That's what Cody did, and that's what Matt Cardona did, basically. So I see him back in WWE after WrestleMania. Ricky Starks, quickly on Ricky Starks. There was a tag team match last night with Top Flight, and they were going against Big Bill and Ricky Starks for the right to wrestle FTR in the AEW Tag Team Title Tournament. Towards the end of the match, there was a pinfall on Ricky Starks that wasn't planned to be the finish, but very clearly should have been a pinfall anyway, as Starks didn't get his shoulders up in time. Starks stood up, took a DDT, and ate a pin. Darius Martin could be seen talking to the referee as the pin happened. I knew immediately that that wasn't the ending of the match. There's no way Ricky Starks and Big Bill were losing to top flight there. Trainers checked on Ricky Starks after the match. Big Bill and Ricky Starks were originally slated to win the match and face FTR in the semifinals. Winner of that would go on to wrestle in the finals at Dynasty. It's probably going to end up being FTR and the Young Bucks anyway. We all know this tournament is predictable, but Big Bill and Ricky Starks should have been there in the semifinals. Starks did Take to Instagram to update everybody and say, I'm all good. Everything checked out fine. Was being precautious. And he's going to be okay. Fightful Select reports Big Bill and Ricky Starks were originally slated to win this match, like I said, and face FTR. Brian Alvarez and Dave Melcher discussed this situation on The Observer Live. Alvarez says, this is not 100% confirmed, but we basically heard the same story, which was that it appears to be a stinger and did not appear to be a concussion. Meltzer then says, Starks said he was okay on social media, from what I understand. Alvarez goes on to say, so hopefully you know a stinger, and he's all right. Sometimes you get them, and then a few hours later, later you're good. Certainly better than a concussion, certainly better than a serious neck injury, end quote. First of all, Starks is done. I said this with Jesse last night while he was watching the show. Thoughts and prayers to Jesse, not really feeling well. He and his son have pneumonia. He was watching the show. He said, bro, after this, Starks is as good as gone. Bro, he's, he's as good as gone right now, he, before the match. He, he's finished. You, you can just tell on his body language, the way he cuts his promos, the way he's just kind of emanating on AEW television, that he's the next defection to WWE. He's gone. And that's good because not everybody is going to remain with AEW a day one He's not going to be there for the rest of his career. Ricky Starks clearly is suffering creatively. I think he would be better suited for WWE, and they would welcome him with open arms. That's not the case here. He was injured last night. I'm glad to know that it's not serious. They were supposed to win the match, and I'm glad he's going to be all right. That's the most important thing here. I saw people mentioning that, well, somebody needs a suspension coming out of this match. They didn't stop the match when clearly Ricky Starks was hurt. Why was Sammy Guevara suspended for what he did for Jeff Hardy? Now, people were trying to make some conspiracy theorist out of this, or conspiracy theory, I should say, out of this with Sammy Guevara. Sammy Guevara was only suspended because Mercedes Monet came to the AEW roster, and they didn't want any butting of heads there after prior comments that Sammy Guevara made five or six years ago when Sasha Banks was in WWE. Whatever the case may be, that's a different situation. The one that happened with Sammy and Jeff Hardy compared to the one that happened with Top Flight and Ricky Stark. Sammy Guevara uh, was told to go home after the referee, you know, said, Jeff is injured, he can't compete anymore, let's go home, just get the pin and get out of here. Sammy Guevara continued 
you know, going against the referee's orders and delivered his finishing move on an already injured Jeff Hardy. So he wasn't following injury or or concussion protocol there. So they suspended him. This was a different situation. There was no there was no uh, referee telling Darius and Dante Martin go home. You know, there was no X. There was no nothing going on here. It was just something that happened in the moment, and that was a completely different situation. Referee alerted Sammy. In this case, the referee did not alert Darius Martin and Dante Martin. So a lot of people are making this out to be a bigger deal than it is. At the end of the day, Ricky Starks says he's okay, and that's all that matters. Now we get top flight versus FTR, which I'm sure will be a banger. And FTR will go on to wrestle the Young Bucks at the pay-per-view because the Young Bucks have best friends in their block. And again, predictable outcome with the Young Bucks probably winning the tag team titles at the pay-per-view. Jade Cargill. A lot of people were making a big deal about Jade Cargill and her debut officially on Friday night. I wish her the best and I wish her success. I don't really see all the hype and the buzz. Is she going to be able to wrestle? That's all I really give a shit about. We knew what WWE was going to do to create and paint her as a superhero and as a megastar. Can she hold her own in the ring? She's going to be under a microscope. I don't want to have to sit here and tell you I was right. Hopefully they prove me wrong. Fightful is reporting that multiple sources have stated that Cargill's entrance has been one that has been worked on for quite some time with multiple changes being made in the last few weeks. The entrance had input from all major producers in the company on angles, lighting, sound, and other factors. It was stressed that the entrance could see some changes, particularly at WrestleMania, with the foundation of the entrance expected to have been established on SmackDown. Here we are talking about nothing more than a fucking entrance. It's great. She's got the entrance down. She looks like a a, a billion dollars. Great. Can she wrestle? We're not going to get a glimpse of that at WrestleMania. She's going to stand on the apron for about 10 minutes before coming in and hitting her big three moves and then go home. That's all we're going to see. Naomi and Bianca are going to take the most of that match and handle it. Jade's going to get the hot tag and come in like the superhero that WWE is presenting her as. It's not really going to be a good foundation for us to see Jake Cargill wrestle. So I hope nothing but the best here. I really do. But all the buzz and all the excitement and all the people overhyping the fuck out of it is just going to turn a lot of people off. Unless she can wrestle and tie everything together, shut the fuck up. Seriously. I don't give a shit about presentation. I don't give a shit about theme music. I don't give a shit about entrance. You all knew to expect that. Can she deliver? That's all I care about at this point because that's the biggest glaring problem from Jade Cargill. So we'll see what happens. And finally, the Andre, the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, one of the most worthless gimmick matches that WWE has during WrestleMania season because the winner ultimately receives nothing. They receive nothing more than a hot dog and a handshake. Now, the match was supposed to take place at WrestleMania. Clearly, WWE is going in a different dim- in a different direction. The match, Meltzer said, was supposed to take place at WrestleMania. Friday, WWE announced it would be taking place on SmackDown this coming Friday from the Wells Fargo Arena. However, in past years, WWE books the go-home show for WrestleMania on SmackDown with the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. There is no women's tag team title match booked after that was reported. We're getting a big six-woman tag team match with damage control going against Jade Cargill, Naomi, and Bianca Belair. Meltzer speculated that we could get another big eight-man tag team match with some factions feuding also added to the card as well. But the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal is taking place on Friday, and the ladies have been given the WrestleMania green light big six-woman tag team match at WrestleMania. Now, the thing with the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal is a lot of people were complaining, including myself, on social media about who has been in this thing and what have they done with them over the past years. Nothing. So then we get... The announcement on Friday that the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal is going to include guys like Ivar, Bronson Reed, Ricochet, Chad Gable, Bobby Lashley, Karrion Cross, so on and so forth. People who realistically should be on the WrestleMania card but aren't. 
So now they're in the Battle Royal, and what do they win if they ultimately win the Andre Battle Royal? Nothing. The problem is WWE needs television time on Friday night. I'm sure they could manufacture television time however which way they want. They have four hours of pre-show. Four hours of pre-show on fr- on Saturday and Sunday, between Saturday and Sunday. WrestleMania's pre-show on Saturday starts at 5 p.m. The show starts at 7. Same thing on Sunday night. Why isn't this battle royal on the pre-show either for Saturday night or, or Sunday night? I don't really understand that. You got all this time to do what? Give me highlight packages, video packages, some fucking fake banter between... Uh, what's his name? Peter Rosenberg and Booker T and all these other fucking useless hacks on WWE's pre-show. Instead of giving these guys at least a little piece of the pie, putting them on the WrestleMania card, whether it's the main card of the pre-show, at least they're in the building in front of that audience to feel that energy, to feel that aura. Now, we'll just put you on SmackDown. So they're not on the WrestleMania card at all. You know, years ago, it was always stated that no matter what, as long as you're a part of the WrestleMania festivities, you're a part of the WrestleMania show. No, you're not. No, you're not. You, you, you could at least go the extra mile and give those guys at least some of the pie on, fr- on Saturday or Sunday instead of Friday. I don't get it. Chad Gable doesn't belong on WrestleMania. He certainly does. Ricochet doesn't belong on WrestleMania. Certainly does. Bronson Reed certainly does. Why not give them either the Saturday or Sunday spot to get the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal inside Lincoln Financial Field on a pre-show? You got four hours. It's inexcusable. WWE dropped the ball there. In fact, I would go a step further and get rid of the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal altogether and come up with some way where you get these guys on the show in some sort of ladder match for a, a number one contendership or something, if the story permits You got all these weeks to tell a story. Get these guys in some matches, give it some meaning, and give them something at the end of the tunnel that they're fighting for instead of just fucking bragging rights that you want a battle royal. It's pretty lame. I hope WWE, I hope Triple H ultimately gets rid of the gimmick because Vince McMahon killed it and has done nothing with it since. That's the best way to go about the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. Guys, thank you very much, and I hope you all have a great Easter Sunday. If you did enjoy today's video, please hit that thumbs up. Let me know what you think down below. Matt Cardona, where's he going to end up? Jade Cargill, the battle royal for WrestleMania, and everything else that I talked about here on today's OTS Extra. Let me know in the comment sections what you think. Follow me on social media, at JD from NY206, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Cameo. And please go check out all the other videos that you might have missed on the channel. There is plenty of content for you guys before we head into what is going to be a crazy week for WrestleMania 40. Hit that thumbs up on your way out, and I'll see you guys live right back here tomorrow night, right here for the Monday Night Raw post show on Off The Script. I'll see you guys later.